Hey everyone, before I dive into the show today, I wanna to give you a little bit of a heads up on what to expect and a bit of a preview. So on today's episode, I'm gonna have Matt Kelly, who has an amazing amount of experience and notes. And in my opinion, is somewhat of a legend in the business. Um, we ended up talking for a really long time, longer than, than planned. So um, what I'm gonna do here is actually break this into two parts. So in today's episode, which I think you're gonna find super valuable, there's going to be a lot of general information on notes with a lot of detail you may not have seen in other places, but more importantly, Matt talks about a long laundry list of sources where you can go and buy now. Um, so if you're listening to the audio version, um, we do talk about some of the sources, but he was actually sharing a screen and had a relatively long list. So if you're interested in finding new places where you can go to buy notes, I uh, highly recommend that you check out the video version on the Fusion Notes YouTube channel where you can get that list. And then in part two, Matt talks about a new website he's got called After Auction Bid. It's actually not um, so much a note related discussion, but talks about a really unique opportunity um, in real estate in California of all places. And then in the meantime, uh, if you're interested in learning even more about notes, highly encourage you to go to fusionnotes.com slash newsletter where you can sign up for my email newsletter where I'm sending things out usually at least once a week, sometimes more. Uh, I have a lot more detailed information about how to become a note investor and then occasionally include things like discounts for some of my online training courses like Note Launchpad. So without further ado, we'll get on to the show. Welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. We'll guide you through the ups and downs of note investing and teach you all about the nitty gritty details of the business that other people won't talk about. Your host, Dan Deppin, is a former aerospace engineer and product manager who transitioned away from cubicle life to full-time note investing in 2018. Our website is www.fusionnotes.com where you can subscribe to this podcast, comment, and find links to other information on note investing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Deppin, and today I'm joined by Matt Kelly. So, Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. I appreciate your time. Yeah, no, thanks for joining. Um, you know, I know we met up at Paper Source the other week, and, you know, we had talked on the phone like once or twice in the past, but I had been meaning to get you on here for a while because you've got a really uh, in-depth knowledge of notes that I would say like goes beyond a lot of the folks that I bump into. So, you know, maybe you could start by talking just a little bit about your background and, and what you do. So briefly said, I'm the founder and owner of a company called After Auction Bid. This is a separate website that provides information, documentation, and education required to purchase real property pursuant to California's SB 1079 and the After Auction Bid process. Separately from that, and presently, I'm a full-time note and real estate investor acquiring nationwide delinquent loans and real property. As I've been a certified foreclosure expert in the states of California, Arizona, Nevada, and Washington, and I've been called upon as an expert witness in the fields of foreclosure, default loss mitigation, and advise some of the largest mortgage servicing companies, credit unions, law firms, and investors throughout the United States. The very quick way to phrase that would be, I have been the one that people would call similar to yourself when needing to enforce their creditor rights, being a foreclosure trustee, but I believe in what I do, or at least did, because I've now converted over into being a full-time investor. But I can nice. share the resources, knowledge, and tools that I developed over the years, not only by processing paperwork, advising others similar to yourself and those that may be listening over the years, uh, but again, how I've implemented those into my own investing strategy. Cool. So how did you get started in notes? Were, were you an attorney originally or what's your? Nope, not an attorney. I'm not here providing legal advice in regards to debt collection or anything else. We're here just having a conversation about what I do, how I do it, and of course, why I do these things. But I got started effectively back in... I think around 2010-ish, and buying on the courthouse steps of the courthouse. I was a foreclosure trustee and advising private beneficiaries similar to yourself and many others along that, those lines. 
And with that knowledge, I knew where it was that a lot of loans were coming from, as in where it is that private investors, similar to myself now, yourself, again, many others, where these notes were coming from, the pricing at which they were being acquired for, and a lot of the nuances involved, because again, I'd have to solve a lot of those problems that would come about and saw just about everything that was out there. So of course, again, I'm going to be involved in this myself. Again, we believe in what we do. It's, I feel it's a very fair question for anybody that is involved within this industry. For There's a lot of ancillary services, things that can be outsourced, some of which we'll be talking about today, whether it be some of the underwriting, some of it from the actual collection, actually reaching out to some of those parties and asking them the basic question of, why don't you do this? There's a very honest response that should come about. Yeah, sounds good. And, you know, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about for, you know, a lot of the audience is kind of new to this space and a lot of people don't even realize that it's possible to buy distressed debt from banks or other institutions or, and then kind of the next step beyond that is they don't realize that you can often buy this debt at a discount. So and we're going to talk a little bit, as you requested within our conversation, as I understand, I cover some things that very few other people's talk about. Please note, I'm not actually here selling anything. I'm not really pushing any particular message. Uh, the only thing I promise you, Dan, is that I'd be honest. So some of the things that most often people pay tens of thousands of dollars through various education programs to learn is not just some of the systems that are included with their level of investing, but also and understanding the industry as a whole, but really wanting to find sources in which they can actually acquire debt. And I am happy to share those, quite honestly, and I share them freely. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about not just the systems and places, but also why this exists to begin with. Like what if you don't mind elaborating, Dan, from your standpoint, what is distressed debt investing? And I'm going to share some slides from some very expensive programs that I've been involved with or presented at, as well as seminars that I've presented at nationwide uh, as to this exact subject. So what's your understanding? What is distressed debt investing? Yeah, to me, it's really just buying debt where, you know, in the distressed case where the borrower is not making their payment every single month, or even if they are now, maybe they haven't in the past. That's another thing that some folks right. find. So distressed debt investing is a form of deep value investing, typically with an event-driven element as well. Currently, COVID could be described as that, but in the past, it was the recession that took place around 2008 to 2013. Please understand that everything in real estate moves very, very, very slowly. So when things seem to be going on, the reality is, is that it actually started years ago. So there's a lot that's ongoing now that much of which will not necessarily come to the surface until quite honestly, it's too late for many. But distressed debt inve investing, as it sounds, does carry risk, but this risk can be measurable, manageable, and predictable. Uh, this is strong underwriting carried by a solid foundation of net of knowledge, a resource, a network of resources, cost-effective tools, in addition to solid business practices, have transformed many investors over time into successful businesses. This is something that can happen certainly overnight. It's possible to grow quickly, but the vast majority of small investors that I have known transitioned from being small individual investors, buying small, having targeted investments, to being able to gradually and over time purchase larger portfolios, taking more diverse risk, but again, distressed debt investing has been around for many years. This is not a new industry. There has been proven to be room for many different types of investors. Uh, as again, larger, small investors often thrive within this industry, largely due to specialized knowledge and targeted investments. Larger entities often finding their success in larger acquisitions, balancing the risk with volume as the successes more than compensate for the losses, while balanced acquisition often for allow for quick recapitalization, sometimes of which by selling to investors similar to ourselves and those that might be listening, and liquidity by having authorized buyers ready to acquire portions of any said portfolio. But we're talking about distressed debt investing, about money being owed. And a lot of the times, this is not it 
started with yourself or myself, or at least other small investors, because then they're hundred percent invested in the debt. They loaned all the money. So rarely they're willing to accept steep discounts to accommodate my require my investing requirements, which, so why are notes really sold, Dan? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of times for an institution, right? Like the debt has a certain value. There's the face value. Um, but if it's distressed, you know, it's probably worth something less than that. And then a lot of times, the inst whether it's an institution or an individual, they're often selling a note because they want to redeploy that money into something else, right? So for example, some of my best deals I got was when a fund had run its course and was winding down. Um, or sometimes I've bought notes from individuals where they wanted to put the money into some other investment, or sometimes they have an investor that that wants to cash out. So there, there's all sorts of different reasons why. So on the screen that I'm sharing right now, it says out of traditional investment area or closing of a fund or a cash call. There's different levels. And there's any of these can be an entry point to an investor. One of the things that I've done in the past, because I've been involved in some very, very large trades is I'll go back within the chain and the chain we'll talk about is looking at the prior owners who ended, it, who bought it, what price did they buy it for? How did they acquire this? Just about everything in between. A lot of the loans that we're referencing were originated with institutional lenders or banks. And with these things, if you've ever seen the movie, The Big Short, which I imagine mm -hmm. you have, I see you smiling. Yeah. Uh, we're taught, that's uh, talking about, that's a movie about insurance. We're the ones that, this happens after that. What happens to those tranches after they collapse? How does it end up from Wall Street to Main Street, where I'm at? Well, one of which is all this is verifiable. I not only have examples about everything I'll be talking about today, but all the information can be looked up and verified as well. On the there's uh, within the pooling and servicing agreements registered most often with the FDIC. This is, uh, as a defined within it, they have these pooling and servicing agreements that explain exactly how, when, where, and why these notes may be sold. One of which is defining a charge off. This is not when a 1099C has been issued, the cancellation of debt. This is effectively the explanation of why it is that certain lenders will stick notes in a drawer and sell them at a later point in time. Uh, they define it as a mortgage loan that's been at least a certain number of days delinquent, as long as they believe, according to accepted servicing practices, that they'll effectively, there's a much longer explanation on the screen in front of me, but there's effectively saying that they will make as much money by charging it off at that given point in time as they will by collecting upon it or doing anything else at that moment. But as again, time passes, notes may increase in value. That may be that there's more money owed on them, that the underlying collateral is worth more, circumstances have changed for the individual involved within that loan regardless that there's some value that exceeds the charge off amount and I though can fulfill their fiduciary duty by selling this to an investor similar to myself, whereas they've effectively agreed not to collect upon it themselves within the past. Uh, the course you reference out of a traditional investment area, I've been involved in trades where I'll buy a nationwide portfolio of notes. This may be hundreds, if not thousands of notes. And a few of them will be within certain states that I just don't have preference in. I know, Dan, you invest in areas like Indiana, Michigan, mm -hmm. a couple other states. Those ones have are less desirable for an investor like myself. And I only say that because you're talking about a judicial state where it's more costly and there's a lot more there's a longer timeline involved with collection and acquiring said property. I'm aware there's a lot of alternatives. We'll get into those ones. But mm -hmm. on the institutional side, there's very little differentiation in value between, let's say, a California note versus an Indiana note. The next of which is closing of a fund or a cash call. Again, that's when they need to make certain well, they need to get some money to uh, meet some requirements. So they'll end up selling some notes to uh, meet those deadlines. It's certainly hard. We'll get there. And of course, passing the buck, and that's not necessarily a good way. So are you referring to like notes with title flaws or other problems? <laughs> uh, that, that's one of which we can talk about those if you want. Like I said, we're just having a conversation and I'll answer anything you want, but not getting stuck on the nuances, because I will point out that 
vast majority of loans, we're talking about Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, VA, even most conventional loans can fit into a nice, pretty little box where all loans fit. And that's something that's perfect. However, we're dealing with kind of the stain on the carpet. This is the out of traditional investment areas. These are discounted, often defaulted notes or scratch and dent loans. There's a lot of different ways these things can be classified, including a very traditional description of non-QM or a non-qualified mortgage for various reasons, such as why it is that those other lenders that would perhaps pay significantly more than myself would actually acquire those notes. But regardless, um, there's a lot of reasons notes may be discounted, and it's not necessarily a flaw, and it's not necessarily something that's terminal. It may be, uh, there's a lot of examples. I'll go into them if you need it, but I understand we're a little bit limited on time. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, one thing I was going to comment on quick, you made a movie reference to The Big Short. This past weekend, I was re-watching the movie Rounders. I don't know if you ever watched that, but it was about yeah. poker players. And in there, Worm goes to prison and he had all this outstanding debt that this like gangster guy bought at 30 cents on the dollar and then beat him up to collect. So it was just kind of funny because I was watching that. I was like, oh, that this gangster guy is doing distressed debt <laughs> investing, although obviously... Mm, World that we're yeah we're not here's quite a yeah, bit I don't, different. I'll be clear I don't I don't support yeah, any of that first no, off I, I don't I don't support buying unsecured debt at thirty cents on the dollar that's insane yeah. next of which is distressed debt investing especially when it comes to secured debt which what you just referenced is not secured debt there are rights and remedies very clearly spelled out within the law the law is my friend there is a lot of individuals, companies, supports, and most importantly, case law, state and federal, that are there to support my rights within this scenario. There's very few new scenarios that come into play. And as much as people love gambling and poker, you and I on many different levels underwrite risk for a living. What that means is we don't want to get into scenarios, if, if the outcome is different than what we predicted, we did something wrong. That may be, quite honestly, we made more money than anticipated, and maybe less, or even when it was made. And there's ways to underwrite that and be very, very accurate within one's predictions. And I know you wanted me to talk about some of those things, but this yeah, is not gambling. And yeah. I would hate to think of it that way, as much as people think, well, it's all about when you lay your cards out, what you do. It's more about knowing your rights, knowing a lot of information, which there's a scary amount available. So these are all things that are entirely possible. Um, where does where do people buy notes? Uh, all kinds of different places, but I, I'm interested to see what you have to say here because that's like the number one question I get from folks. Good, let's answer so, yeah. it then. Uh, I have a, on the screen in front of me a different list of note auction sites. Uh, keep in mind, uh, they have much more extensive ones that I'll be showing as well for those that watch the video version of this. Uh, note auction sites can certainly be overpriced and highly picked over. They are designed for small investors and individual purchases. Performing notes do sell for average about 75 to 90 percent of the unpaid principal balance. Yes, 8 to 14 percent returns are common. That's over a 20 percent yield. Non-performing notes typically sell for 21 to 68 percent of any balances. Returns vary but are traditionally significantly higher. I listed a number that are here, data and my opinion of some of them. Uh, Deb Expert, D-E-B Expert.com, Paperstack, PaperSTAC.com, Pre-REO, Notes Trader, NLAX, Watermark Exchange, Stackfolio, Notes Trader Exchange, Notes Direct. Not all these are great, but there's different strategies. This is references the bottom up, and I'm also going to talk about a sourcing campaign that's top down. The bottom up is looking at some of the aggregating websites where a lot of this these notes are individually available. It's not usually the first stop for this note. Usually some other investor that had them did some things with it and are now selling it for one of the reasons that we previously discussed. But when one is on here, one can look at the chain of title. You can often look at some of the notes that are in relation to the transaction, and I'm talking about the underwriting notes, you, you name it, there's a lot of different information that's available, some of which will go over the actual underwriting process. Uh, that may include bankruptcy history, but regardless, looking at individual notes and seeing where it has been in the past, looking at the chain of assignments. When you buy notes, Dan, sometimes there's 
two, three, four assignments recorded prior than it makes its way to myself. So I, I want to know how it is that those that came before me were able to acquire this, presumably at a lower price, where they can actually afford to sell it to me at a price that is still attractive to me and make a profit, especially being so far out from the original source. Well, I can go there, I can find some of the assignments of Deed of Trust, I can find the names of some people that are involved or at least worked at those companies and see if I can track some of the individuals down via LinkedIn, because if they're no longer at that company, they're usually at another one that's more active with similar type of product. They can find some of those companies and see the people that were involved as they sold at one point, see if they're selling now or they're involved with other companies that have similar, similar activity that's taking place. And of course, just see if there's a diamond in the rough. I have in front of screen that says today's marketplace for the small buyer. These are various brokers, uh, not that representing them as licensed because a lot of them are not necessarily licensed brokers. And please note that describing oneself as a broker is a licensed term and that there is legal requirements to describing oneself as such. Uh, but regardless, these are some of the ones that I provided a little bit earlier. These are all ones that basically anybody can get on their mailing list. And if one does so, they will send you tapes of notes that they will provide various opportunities. And generally speaking, they really don't care if you ever buy, but it can provide the best way to learn, in my opinion, which we'll get into in the actual underwriting portion of this conversation. But it allows oneself to do what's called the dry run and that you go through, do all the underwriting, look at all the information and develop one's pricing and then don't buy. And what I mean by that is compare notes with somebody else. If it's such an amazing deal that you can't pass it up, do it. But if it's anything short of, well, quite honestly, seeming that it's amazing, we're not pushing anybody to get into situations that they may deem uncomfortable. So there's no harm in doing these, some of the work that is absolutely free, that it doesn't cost anything or is extremely low cost to go through the underwriting process, learning all the information and then comparing notes to somebody else, whether it be a trusted advisor, someone else within the industry, maybe it's even the winning bidder because you'll be able to find out most often through the broker or through the website or even public records who eventually won that trade and see if there's something that you overlooked that caused them to price it lower or something that they felt made this note more valuable than otherwise predicted. There's also other servicers who list available notes. Please note servicers they do not actually hold any beneficial interest. And this may be companies like PHH, even Bank of America. They may not necessarily be the ultimate investor, so they cannot necessarily authorize the actual sale of a note. Then there's other, of course, beneficiaries that do regularly sell, similar as myself, yourself, others that, of course, uh, may be selling. Yeah, one thing I want to call out to you for the people who are just listening to the audio version, like you've got a lot of great information on where to potentially find notes which is like the biggest thing that people struggle with so if you listen to it on audio i highly encourage you to go back and look at the youtube version of this because there's some more uh, great information in here and is, this is correct me if i'm wrong a lot of the things i'm presenting here this is one of the education programs most treasured information that i really share yeah <laughs> And I'm not in education. I, I answer questions freely. I make my money by actually investing and by doing. That's one of the reasons I so freely share. And I don't really view anybody else's competition. And what I mean by that is there is more than enough notes that are out there for just basically everyone. I've rarely ever competed with somebody else head to head for any particular note or even a portfolio. There's more than enough business for everyone. But it is true where to really find notes is it's true that note sellers don't usually sell their best notes. Note brokers are often used to distance themselves from a troubled note or a broke borrower. There's a lot that can be covered up in those aggregating websites. Note auction sites are often overpriced and highly picked over. Servicers cannot authorize the sale of a note because again, they do not hold beneficial interest. Private lenders are often 100% invested and rarely accept steep discounts. Other beneficiaries often sell what's outside their business model, but difficult to catch at the right time. Professionals do not use Facebook or LinkedIn to market the availability of notes. So how I find these note holders who sell, who do not heavily work them and does not openly market their availability of the notes, conferences. 
conferences are great. You can network with other individuals similar to yourself. I spoke at a couple conferences and I said at the very least newer investors going to some of them. Look around the room, hearing some people that have done this with some success within the past and some have immense success. Dear God, look around the room and if you think some of those guys can do it, trust me, you can too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a little bit of education exposure, fun and a write-off, but realistically, you don't need to go to conferences because the smaller ones, no major hedge funds attend those events and large investment companies don't require education. If I learn something at a conference, it means that I may have been doing something wrong on files for the last six months to a year, meaning that I may have done things wrong in thousands and thousands of files, which is deeply problematic. But you don't actually need to go to get the information you need. And I listed some conferences such as IMN, CLO, MBA, which is the Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, the fivestar.com and structuredfinance.org. These are all mega conferences that are very expensive to attend. One would also be the smallest fish in a very, very big pond by going. But realistically, all one actually wants is the attendee list. That's going through and separating out investors similar to ourselves, but also setting aside all the vendors that want my business, the ones that I don't really want to talk to. They want to talk to me all the title companies, all the skip tracers, all the accountants, all the lawyers setting those ones aside and just weeding through and trying to find the larger companies with product that I'm really looking for so that I can call and solicit them. I don't even necessarily need the individual that attended because quite honestly, it may be his boss or even maybe their underling that I'm really needing to talk to. I just wanna know the active companies with product that I that have what I want. And I found that a conference attendee list are one of the best ways to acquire that. But there is off-market notes. I talked about the bottom-up approach with looking at some of the aggregating websites. One can also follow large trades. This is the top-down approach. This is very easy to qualify for these. This can be from FFN Corp, Mission Cap, DEDX. Those are all the FDIC licensed brokers. And this is where often banks are required to sell because keep in mind, you're talking about, and some other people have talked about bank direct trades. That's often very, very misleading as the very honest truth about it is if there was one person at a bank that could authorize the sale or transaction of any given note or even a portfolio, some of which are tens of millions of dollars, either in acquisition costs or at least an unpaid principal balance, there's those that would be very tempted to just ask that one person at that one bank, hey, discount this stuff a little bit more and what color Porsche would you like in your driveway? For those reasons, they deliver every time. Not saying that necessarily that that's myself, but regardless, the truth is, is that most often these banks are required to sell via arm's length third party transactions. That's why licensed brokers are most often involved and some of these aggregating websites are utilized. But the, you can follow some of these large trades and whereas myself, I'm not going to be able to acquire the entire thing just from the cost perspective, but also it's not necessarily cost, it may not be cost effective to underwrite the entirety of the portfolio. And that's because there are certain hard costs that are involved very often, some for time's sake, others just because of necessity in trying to look at the various risk factors involved with this debt. So we can actually, rather than trying to buy the entire whale, is see who acquired that portfolio and either acquiring some of the recently acquired portfolio that they just bought or rather what they're liquidating to be able to have the capital to acquire this new debt. So, but this old list and contacts are certainly worth their weight in gold. And that's finding out who purchased the larger trades, following up with them. Purchasers of performing pools do often sell notes, which become delinquent. And again, for a discount, larger hedge funds will sell notes from trades, which do not necessarily fit their business model. And of course, people who covered in a trade desk or involved in certain trades often do transfer to similar jobs at uh, other locations, but of course, more active companies. So Dan, I take it you wanted to some advice for new investors, and we'll go into some of the underwriting as well. Uh, why yeah, is investors? Great. Yeah, <laughs> why is again for new investors reverse engineer success, and this is why is investors pursue opportunities. It takes place in many forms. Most investors, including seasoned ones, do fall into habits on focusing regionally areas in which they are familiar and have strong legal network or legal representation. This is not bad, but certainly limited. Educators pushing, quote, investor identity, unquote, are selling something, but it's not notes and it's not education. Understanding fundamentals stresses underwriting. This is understanding title, borrower underwriting, asset evaluation, and data-driven investing. 
Starting with a performing note to understand the process is advice given most often by experienced investors looking to offload reperforming notes onto significantly less informed investors. Do not base your exit strategy on a best case scenario, but rather the worst and see if it still works. Do not trust what you see on Facebook, email, marketing. Please verify everything and everyone. Almost anything can be taught except for the ability to ask a question and information is freely available. Here you have a podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but for the intermediate investors, the tide of notes is always out there, but sometimes it goes in a different direction. New sources are extremely valuable. Relationship buying is not professional. A very important component to aggressive acquisitions and competitive bidding is possessing the ability to lose bids and not have a detrimental amount of cost to be rolled into the next investment, knowing that not only the information where it comes from, but how to verify it. This is creatively sourcing notes is encouraged, but creatively collecting is litigious. Please find additional sources through ancillary vendors and conferences. What that last statement was is that there are conferences very specific to note investing, but there's a lot of areas involved with note investing. And that includes the actual collecting on non-performing debt, such as a foreclosure conference, this may also include things like title conferences, some of were skip tracing, things like that. Awesome. Man, so there are a huge amount of good details in there. So like I said, then the sources in particular, I mean, that's a level of depth that I think a lot of people have really been looking for for a long time. So yeah, I really appreciate you taking everyone through that. Well, it'll, I understand we have a few minutes left. We can go over some of the technology systems and underwriting. Yeah, that sounds good. We got, yeah, actually. Um, I, see, I see the clock. We have a- See the clock? Okay. Yep. <laughs> this is a real problem. Very few reputable and seasoned investors currently facing are often growth problems, cash flow problems, and personnel problems. Uh, for bids and underwriting costs, I did emphasize earlier how it's important to be able to bid, but also lose comfortably and not having to roll the cost of underwriting into the next transaction, which is making one less aggressive and less likely to win the next trade as a result. Uh, but with excessive options available to investors, many at a cost, few entities are seeing the consequences of this bidding strategy. Uh, some of these uh, services can be very, very expensive. While much can be outsourced, not all of it should be. Uh, next of which is lack of understanding, which is not understanding the information products provide, which translates not being able to double check or source the information. I'm most often talking about title reports, and this is being able to understand where the information actually comes from, because most often title reports are not insured products. This is not a trust, uh, an insured product, similar to a right. title policy. And I've seen errors on title reports yep. as well. So, or things so what I'm talking about, here. outsourcing and vendors can add value, but it also can greatly diminish one's bottom line. It's price is what you pay. Value is what you get. For bankruptcy, there's really nothing that's gold standards pacer, as this is directly searching the court's website. It just costs a couple pennies. If you don't know much about bankruptcy, the best thing to do is to read active bankruptcy documents, as every document is self-explanatory, and bankruptcy is a great way of understanding a given investment opportunity for a note or an individual because it is a snapshot of a person's life at a given point in time, why they filed, what the bankruptcy did, what debts they had, things along those lines. Credit reports can also be very helpful. Uh, Credco, uh, sorry, CoreLogic Credco is a great resource for individual and new small investors, as these credit reports tend to elaborate upon much of the debt that exists with that individual's life, helping determine their ability to repay, but also see in the event somebody's buying such as second mortgages as to what may be taking place with their senior debt, such as a first mortgage. That's a whole different conversation, so we'll just skip over it. For data and statistics, more data-driven investing as to given areas, industry trends, and insights, Adam Data, A-T-T-O-M-D-A-T-A.com, has a wealth of information. Property values, I'm a fan of Zillow. I'm a, I know there's a ton out there. I'm not saying Zillow's accurate because it's not but it tends to be a good guideline as the phrase is we do surgery with shotguns rather than lasers. It's not always the most targeted of investments, but it tends to be fairly accurate over time. But if one's of course investing in very rural areas where there's not a lot of data, then of course that's something that 
it will be less accurate than somewhere like Los Angeles and areas where there's a lot of volume and a lot of data that's available. Uh, for title investing, most can utilize things like TitleFlex, which is data tree. There's other ones that are free services that are pretty good and they're not bad for a glance. I do stress, go to the county recorder website, do a grantor grantee index search with the borrower's name and see what's out there. Uh, there's occupancy and skip tracing. TLO is great for small investors. This is TLO.com to be able to actually locate the homeowner, their contact information, and quite a bit of personal information about them. Don't worry, before we get on the call, don't worry, Dan, I did look up yourself. You do own a considerable amount of properties. That's how I knew where oh, and you yeah. invested. I could have gone over your sources, but they're quite honestly already included in my slides. Yeah.